So welcome, 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 welcome. Yeah, so happy to be here with you all. <clears throat> it's, um, it's always a good night for the Dharma, but I think it's especially a good night for the Dharma when some of the more core suffering of our world just pops up above the surface. When we're faced with hatred and intolerance and aggression and violence, it's a time in which the Dharma especially gives us an anchor, an island, a bridge. And so I'm just really delighted to be here with you all, especially given <clears throat> some of the challenging times of this last week and where that may be landing with you all in terms of your own experience of empathy, maybe your own experience of deep connection to what has happened in Atlanta or in Colorado. And happily, Chandra and I have decided in these next couple of weeks that we're really gonna focus in on Tonglen. And I was thinking about Tonglen this evening before we got started. It is an unbelievable technology. It is like a technology of transforming salt water into drinkable water when you're dying of thirst. It takes that which is all around you and makes it instead of something depleting and difficult, overwhelming with pain and makes it a source of energy and light. That's what it gives us. I mean, it's, you know, I, I, uh, I know many of you on this call, of course, appreciate this feeling, but where is our true refuge? Where is it? There's so many wonderful things we can enjoy in the world and the sunlight and the waves and food and friends. And yet, of course, we need a deeper refuge and we need certain technologies to get there. And Tonglen is, is one of those technologies. So I'm gonna just orient a little bit of this evening. I'm gonna start and really kind of more formally welcome you. A lot of beautifully familiar faces. Nice to see you friends. And I think maybe folks coming even for the first time. So orient you a bit to this awesome constellation of beings. And then I'm gonna tell us a bit about Tonglen. <clears throat> for many of you, such a familiar practice but revisiting the core tenets of it can be really helpful. For many of us, the last thing we think about when we open ourselves up to the suffering of the world is, okay, let me have more. This sounds good. Suffering? Yes, bring it in. And yet that's what we do with Tonglen. So we kind of want to have a little bit of preamble. And we still are here making our way through this epic collection of slogans, these Lojong slogans we've been working on now, I think, at least five months. Um, Chandra and I share a single document together of our notes, and it's well over 90 pages now. And so I can tell that we're getting, getting our way through. And the slogan we're working with tonight, meaning the single phrase that we are using to turn the mind, is a phrase about relationship. And I think it's a really fitting phrase for our focus on, on Tonglen because so much of our training of how do we bring these ideas and aspirations of meditation and compassion to the world is in relationship. Not only with ourselves, that's hard enough, but other people, my God, it's nearly impossible. How do we really, how do we really find our way to bring and make this path alive with others? We don't do this meditation work so that we can somehow be kind of anesthetized or removed from the world. We do this work so literally we can, as Chandra said a couple of week, weeks ago, like Hanuman, bear open our chest to the world with strength and with power. So that's a little, a little preview of our evening, talking about Tonglen, talking about relationship, and of course, discussion and questions. So another formal welcome to you all to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. This is, <clears throat> as far as we know, the only volunteer run Dharma Collective maybe in the world. Such a wonderful experience to be here really in community. There <clears throat> is an ancient teaching which says that the Buddha of the future is the Sangha. And what that literally means is the, the teachings and the teacher that we are looking for it's all of us. It's in our community. I think we're a living example of that. And um, this collective really prioritizes creating community that can make people feel open, 
included, held, and understood. So our priorities here is that we create a space of understanding and compassion. During the pandemic, <laughs> needless to say, there's been a lot going on for all of us. And I really encourage you in our shared space here to keep in mind this, this priority of non-harming to ourselves and to this space together. So if someone asks a question or makes a comment <clears throat> that maybe you don't agree with or feel like it's somehow um, unskillful or unwise, we invite and engage you to, we invite you to engage with some compassion and empathy. And we also invite you before you speak to be considerate, recognizing that most of us show up for the Dharma because indeed life is hard and things are tough. And so what we're bringing into the shared space together, this um, kind of, we're this vessel we are all on, be considerate of how it might impact others. And I want us to really keep in mind that we can see maybe these tiny little squares of one another, but we have no idea what's going on in each of our lives, what experiences are leading up to us arriving here. So really requesting just a sense of gentleness in our communication. And that communication includes <clears throat> what we say, but also that inner speech. So really noticing um, how we engage with and interact with each other in this field. So my request for you is to really consider these spiritual qualities for our time together, that the entire experience of being in this Zoom space is training on every level. Training, noticing when we feel slightly annoyed if the sound goes out, training and knowing if we get really excited, because here we are getting to discuss this with one another, bringing that joyful enthusiasm. And I invite you as much as possible, <clears throat> like many of you, I spend a lot of my hours in front of a screen. And I think this habit that is forming, at least for me, of multitasking is profoundly eroding my attention and my compassion. So I invite you to give yourself the generosity of doing just this. I know that for many reasons, having your camera on may not be possible. It is a nice way to help you stay in check right? Because we're kind of focusing here, maybe not going over there, or going to this place. But if you don't have your camera on, I invite you instead to this posture of dignity and presence, choosing to show up here with your full self for one another and for this practice. Okay, so with that, I'm going to just get us started into thinking about Tonglen. So many of you have done this practice before. It's often called <clears throat> a practice of sending and receiving. It's a practice that um, is one of the foundations of our work here in doing the Lojong. And Tonglen means that we really consider suffering. And we actually have the courage to really be aware of that suffering. There is not a day that goes by for any of us where we could pretend that there isn't suffering. So the first level of Tonglen, the first step is, I'm gonna recognize there is suffering. And even the courage that that requires is quite profound. But there's also this next level. And that next level of courage is that we actually want to transform this. We want to not only look at the suffering, but hold our heart open with this desire, I wish it was different. This is an intrinsic fundamental aspect of our humanity. Happily, evolution has selected for us these traits of sociality. We are meant to live together. We are meant to care for each other. Of course, things get complicated in this world where there are so many calls to suffering, but it is our intrinsic nature to care about that. <clears throat> and so it's not as though we're generating this kind of false desire here to care about the suffering of another we're actually revealing what's always already there, revealing that natural gold of the heart. The next level of courage with our Tonglen is to do this for all beings. And that is a huge courage. I think for many of us, you know, there's already the day-to-day -day <clears throat> challenges in our life with our friends and our loved ones. And then we read the news and we would just just as rather not, just as rather not open up to more suffering. I have enough. Why should I take on more suffering? 
And the attitude of Tonglen is that we actually can't address any suffering unless we address all suffering. That the tools we develop in order to take in the suffering of the world are the very same tools that we learn to be with our own suffering. There's a really beautiful analogy that describes this interesting paradox. <clears throat> if we imagine our compassion as maybe only the size of a teacup, I have a small teacup and it's full of water. And within that teacup, those are the people I care about. That's just my sangha here, maybe a couple other loved ones. And that's all I can care about. I have a small vessel of compassion. So if one person in my small vessel becomes ill or sick or dies, everything is displaced. Everything is disturbed. Whereas instead, if we imagine that our sphere of compassion is the entire ocean, everyone is my concern, all beings and this planet. There's so much more space for all of the suffering, all of the illness and all the loss. <clears throat> These are just concepts and ideas. They're poetry, but I just want you to notice if something in that rings true. It's so difficult for us. I, I was very fortunate to <clears throat> be talking with a longtime friend and colleague named Jamil Zaki. He's a neuroscientist of empathy and he studies a lot of our propensities naturally to care about one another. It's always very heartening to talk with him. He's not a practitioner, but he <clears throat> reads our neural and physiological signals. He knows that when we witness suffering, we want to care. We want to ameliorate pain. One of the reasons that we get stuck, right? If you think of, well, <laughs> You've just told me that our brains and our bodies are set up for empathy. <clears throat> so how come that's not the world we live in? How come we look around and it's not a world of everybody with their arms around each other, swaying in love with enough to share? It's because it really hurts when we can't help each other. Part of our empathy gets blocked and we feel like I can't, I don't have any, I'm, I'm not available. So that distress is called an empathic distress. We know there is suffering and there's nothing we can do. So the magic of Tonglen is it gives us a feeling and a, and a capacity to do something. Tonglen is an act of compassion as well as a stance of compassion. We are no longer helpless. We are no longer without efficacy. We are directly meeting and addressing the suffering and we are choosing courageously to transform it. I hope you feel that energy of, of the warrior in this call to Tonglen. It is really pulling ourselves up, like up by the spine, up by the heart to meet the suffering of the world. So in this practice of Tonglen, we're going to start, which is very traditional, with this, what is called flashing on bodhicitta. And what that means, it's, it's quite interesting. <clears throat> is that in order for us to really kind of prime the pump of our compassion, we also have to recognize the openness and emptiness of all things. Another beautiful paradox. For us to really open our heart, we have to realize actually the heart is transparent, that all suffering is kind of immaterial. And so we do so at once, we do this like beautiful dance of generating a heartfelt sentiment of care while not getting drenched in that care, not getting overwhelmed, not, be, not succumbing or being pulled underneath because we recognize the fluid, ever-changing nature of everything. It's just unbelievably beautiful, <laughs> um, which I hope you will get a taste and flavor of in your own practice. So we'll flash on bodhicitta actually by reflecting on our innate capacity for compassion, traveling back in time, traveling into the future, and really sensing what is the capacity of this heart to love and to receive love? How much love is there? Is there a breaking point where the heart becomes so overwhelmed that it never comes back? And I hope through your inquiry, you'll see that even our most shattered of heart moments, there is still heart, there's still emptiness. 
intrinsic capacity. We wouldn't want to engage in this practice of Tonglen, of deciding to transform without really knowing our own capacity. I'll raise two hands. Anyone else want to raise a hand for giving too much before actually resourcing oneself? Anybody here do that? Let me help you. Let me help you. So we're going to reverse that trend and really attend to our own capacity, really feel that strength before we offer it. That's our stable base that which we can then kind of radiate out this experience. Tonglen operates in the imaginal. We actually use our imagination. This is a space, unfortunately, in our day to day that is evaporating. We have less and less opportunity to come up with our own images, our own ideas, our own stories, our own poetry, except for the fortunate makers among us. And so how do we kind of generate and connect back to that imaginal, that inner language, our intuitive knowing? Meditation is such a beautiful place for that, and especially these practices that are visualizing others. It doesn't matter how good your visualization is. It doesn't matter if you can very easily bring to mind someone who's struggling and see the contours of their face. The whole activity is just strengthening this imaginal capacity, this ability to bring forth an image and to generate that heartfelt experience. Okay, that was a lot of preamble. I hope it's useful. <clears throat> and we will go ahead and get, get ready with our practice. So let's begin by finding our posture. The posture for Tonglen and compassion really highlights these beautiful qualities of dignity, vividness and uprightness in the spine. And utter gentleness and ease through the front. Softening through the forehead, softening through the eyes. Softening through the chest and the belly. Find a posture where the shoulders feel relaxed, supported by your thighs or maybe folded in the lap. With the spine upright, find a slight tilt of the chest upwards towards the ceiling. Soften and soften and soften and soften through the gaze. And for these first breaths, settling into our body, its natural state, finding qualities of stillness, <clears throat> presence and ease. Of course, the mind will be doing the mind's thing. Keep coming back to this quality of stillness by noticing the sensations throughout the body. Noticing there are sensations in different discrete areas with different discrete qualities, maybe warmth in the chest, maybe tightness or aching in the low back or shoulders.
and as a first part of our tonglen, as we're attending to this body and its sensations, <clears throat> we may become aware quite easily of some challenge or difficulty, some residue in the body that is challenging. With gentleness and tenderness, feel as though you can make space for whatever is here in the body. And then inviting ourselves to settle and continue settling by focusing in on the rhythm of the breath. <clears throat> noticing the inhale, noticing the exhale. How gently and how brightly can you notice the contours of inhale and exhale? And though the mind, of course, may get caught up in distractions, memories, images, worries, for a moment, see if you can settle the mind into a natural state of openness and warmth. The mind which lies beneath those thoughts, memories, images, and distractions. The mind which like the very bottom of the ocean remains unperturbed, no matter what the conditions are above. Just this moment, this breath, this mind, this heart.
we'll gently shift and transition from noticing of the body, the speech and their mind, settling them into their natural states and to this realm of imagination and mind, memory. We'll begin by going back in time and considering all of the love in this life that we have received. The love we've received from friends or loved ones, people who maybe are no longer even with us, strangers along the way. Without a need to get specific or create a catalog, open up to this felt experience of minutes upon minutes and hours upon hours and years and decades of having received love. It's okay if this feels challenging or edgy at this moment. Maybe just one example rises to the surface of a time that felt connected, caring. But feeling this continuity of time, all of that love which has been received still right here, present in this moment. I'm taking a moment now to consider again, in the biggest, broadest strokes possible, all the love which you have extended in this life. To those near and dear, to those no longer with us, to those maybe whose names you no longer even recall, a face, just a fading memory, all the ways that we've met and cared, shared compassion, understanding, in connection with other beings. Feel or imagine an inexhaustible quality of this love which has been extended, of this love which has been received. And start feeling the quality of this love at the heart center. Imagining it as a sort of radiant light like the sun. I'm taking a moment now to project into the imagined future. In the minutes and hours, the days, the weeks, the months, the years and decades to come, how much love will we be receiving and experiencing? Maybe people we haven't even yet met. Maybe those right near us now. How much love could we possibly continue to receive over and over and over again? Again, this is the love of presence, the love of care. Tenderness and kindness. And now imagining all the love 
we will extend in these years and decades to come over and over again with new and with familiar people. Feel this innate capacity of the heart. Feel the radiance of it at the chest. And while keeping in mind this trajectory of love past and future, of course, we recognize there's a love present. And simply breathing in this experience of love that is all around us, that is within us. And as we breathe out that same experience of love all around us and within us, does it need to be metaphysical or mystical? The simple reality that we all are here because of love. With this radiance of light at the heart, we'll begin our Tonglen practice <clears throat> by considering ourselves. This is traditional, not only in contemporary practices of self-compassion, but even in the great lineages of Tibetan Buddhism. So consider one area of your life, maybe even of your day, where there's a contraction in the heart, sorrow or fear, jealousy or anger, something that could really use that radiant light of love. <clears throat> Whatever comes easily to mind is perfectly welcome and invite that consideration of this part of yourself which is suffering or struggling. Imagine as though you were sitting right in front of you. Then you could see that difficulty and challenge. You could see it written over your face. You could feel it radiating. And notice or imagine that natural tingling of the heart that genuine, authentic compassion for our own well-being. And with our next breaths, through the inhale, we imagine clearly seeing this image of ourself and our struggle and feeling the heart's felt aspiration for it to change. As we exhale, we extend out love and radiant light from the heart. Inhale, drawing in this heartfelt compassion. Exhale, extending out radiant light, transforming as though dissolving the dark clouds or fog. A couple more breaths here, using the rhythm of your own inhale and exhale to draw in and extend this compassion for yourself here and now. Releasing the image of yourself, releasing the idea of this hurt or difficulty. And taking a moment to settle in and notice the field of compassion that has been generated in the body. Notice sensations in the face, 
around the throat, the chest. Notice the belly and the hands. Feel this body as a body of compassion. Now we get to shift and open our sphere of concern. Considering either someone close to us, a friend or loved one, or someone who's really moved our heart this week, reading about the recent tragedies in the world. There could be someone in your life who in this moment could really use compassion. For whom you'd like to ease off some of the burden. Or it could be that your heart is just aching with the family members of those who lost a loved one. So bring to mind either a single person or a group of persons whose suffering is apparent and blatant and real. Bring them vividly to mind as though they were in front of you. Notice the stirring of the heart, that natural upwelling of compassion. We bring them to mind to make their suffering real, to ignite the pilot light flame of our own compassionate heart. And then find that radiance, that intrinsic unbreakable compassion. And with our next breaths, We invite in courageously the struggle and difficulty into our sphere of care and concern. And the moment that we invite it in, we transform it, lighting it up with that compassion at the heart and extending out clear light, love. So engaging in this transformative practice, breath by breath, drawing in the pain and the difficulty, brightening and opening wide, extending out clear light and love. Continuing on the rhythm of your own breath, continuing to deeply dig into that well, bringing forth that care and consideration and extending out our heart and its radiance in all directions. This very practice, breath by breath, this is our gymnasium of compassion. It's not as though we expect our wishes for happiness to be fulfilled. It is where we strengthen the heart to be open to suffering. Inhale, courageously finding this will and courage to engage with the suffering of the world. 
and exhale fully, openly, joyfully extending our love and care. couple more breaths here as though we were drawing in these final last bits of difficulty and challenge that we could lighten and then extending out the goodness of our own heart. Releasing the image of this person or persons. And leaning back in to rest once again in this field of embodied compassion. And let the mind mix with compassion and space. Unbounded, unfettered, warm, open. And gently, without really uprooting from this place and space of compassion, start swaying the body backward and forward to the left and to the right. Gently wiggling the fingers and toes, blinking the eyes back open and taking your time to come back into our shared space. Thank you for your practice. Okay, friends, thoughts, reflections, questions. I think you can raise your hand slash unmute slash work the chat. I see a hand, Leanne. Oh yes. Well, I feel that I'm, I often ask a question first. So I want to see if anyone else would like, okay. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'm uh, really grateful for your your opening to the class. I found it really helpful in terms of orienting myself towards Tanglen, like really. And then um, I guess I have a point of clarification, a share with some with a question. <laughs> Both. And uh, I'll save the clarification for the end. But so my my experience was really beautiful in the first half you know, all the love, I was like, wow. And then I, when it came time to kind of pick like who to give that, you know, the compassion to, I, I'm very blessed right now that nobody in my life is really suffering. And so I had a moment of like, who, and I sort of, I don't know if you had said, but I, I assumed we were going to go through the all four of like, mm -hmm. love. so I had people on deck for like, <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, this person in my life who I'm feeling challenged with, she's a friend, we'll put her there. And, um, and I've also sort of been on a little hiatus from the news. Like I, you know, I've, mm. I, I've heard about the shooting and, but, but not really engaging just for the last like two weeks. And I, I'm also at the same time in like, probably the best place I've been in a while from otherwise being on the path to feeling suicidal, like as recent as the fall. And mm. so there's a bit of, um, and I, so I noticed this resistance, this difficulty in actually like conjuring first in picking someone and then in conjuring people in the news or the things in a way that felt in any way real. And it yeah. just made me reflect one on like, the desensitivity, like, okay, so am I desensitized in how we, we engage with the news? And that brings me to the point of clarification was just when you were talking about like, well, if our natural state is compassion, why is all this in the world? You said something that was an aha moment and then it like left me. Yeah. But yeah, I guess, I guess. And so I, on the one hand felt resistance of like, oh, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm finally good. Like, I don't want to pop my bubble because I, I feel fragile, but I know that's wrong. And I know that like, in fact, you, I feel better and deeper have feeling compassion for others and feeling like engaged and connected, you know, but uh, yeah, I guess I'm just curious, like about that fuzziness, like how can you yeah. really, yeah. I know it's okay to go into the general um, love for everybody, but yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and I really just thank you for the um, specificity and clarity. I, I know that your question is shared by a lot of people. Um, and, you know, it is, you know, I, I rejoice with you that there's not like tumult in this moment and that you've overcome, you know, a more acute phase. And I totally get that, you know, and it is, um, I can, I, I think a little bit of resistance is so natural. Like, oh, no, I just went through all that. Like, no, 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 not right now. Right. And, and that's great. And you can even practice with that. And, you know, when we're with a teacher, it's, um, it's a nice opportunity. And it's not necessarily what's right for us right now. Um, and so it could be that your Tong Glenn is going to be so on point tomorrow morning, when someone who's suffering enters your field of concern, and you're just like, I'm taking it, and I'm giving. Right. And so we're, we're practicing now, but it's OK if right now isn't the moment when it's clicking in. And, you know, I, I too, was on a bit of a news hiatus. Um, my partner mentioned that there's been a lot going on. And because of class, I was like, I'm going to explicitly do Tonglen with the news. Um, and so I think it's really a great we, I think we've talked about this a couple of times in, in these sessions, but I think using the news for Tonglen is really wonderful and making it explicit. Not like I'm casually looking at it right before I go to bed when I should not definitely be looking at a screen and I'm not have the space to take care of myself, but really like I'm gonna spend these next 15 minutes and I'm gonna look and I'm actually, you know, as we did in the practice, give myself a moment to imagine. Cause you're right, we can get desensitized. And I'm not, I'm not encouraging us to kind of engage with overwhelm and yet, it really does help our sense of common humanity to recognize this person suffering just like me. I could imagine it being me. It's so interesting with empathy. What we really need to do is recognize it could be us and it, it is not us. So in psychology, this is, you know, our ability to not merge directly with the suffering of another while still being present with that suffering. It's a knife's edge, really is. Um, I also think it can be really great, and, and Pema Chodron gives wonderful instructions on this, <laughs> to have an ongoing list of people that you want to practice Tonglen for, so that when the practice arises, and you said you had some on deck, right? So it, it doesn't always have to be um, the suffering of the world. I just find it, I do find the suffering of the world quite overwhelming. Um, and, you know, especially with, well, whatever, with everything, gun violence is one of many, but you know, with gun violence. And so it, it's an area for me that kind of naturally will click in. Um, but for all of us, that changes a lot. And like I said, I think that on the spot Tonglen can sometimes be the most powerful, right in the moment when we witness another suffering in front of us, whether in the news or in person. So thank you. And thank you for being the first. Thank you. Yeah, I see Lucy. Hi. Hi. Uh-oh, you're muted. 
Can you hear me? I can. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for the practice because uh, I lost my mom recently mm -hmm. and I just was able to give myself compassion through this and was kind of just tears were coming and I want to help others. That's like my job is to provide support for other mo mothers and um, I just wasn't doing it. Uh oh, Lucy, we can't hear you. Can you still hear us? She's not muted, Eve, so. Okay. Well, um, Lucy, I hope you can hear us. I am um, I moved to hear about your mom. I lost my mom in the last year also. And yeah, it is such an important time to be tender with our own heart. And if you are in the position of needing to professionally support others while tending to your own heart, it is a heroic time. And uh, I have no um, tricks or tips other than it will keep changing and shifting, right? When we are in these acute periods of loss, it's a very tender time. It's a very tender time. And wow, is it an incredible empathy gymnasium, right? When we are so close to our own suffering, we're so close to the suffering of the world. So thank you for that. Ted, I see a hand. Hi, do we want to wait for her to uh, log back in? Lucy. When she does, we okay. will absolutely. Okay. Um, I have, there's specific issues that give me <laughs> specific angst and gun violence is one of them. Um, um, and, and, you know, you know, in the behavioral sciences that uh, the most stressful condition is when a being has no control over, um, you know, over its, over the, well, in this case, over the outcome, but, um, and th this keeps happening. I mean, not, you know, whether the news is covering it or not. And I'm, I'm so, um, I find myself, I find myself turning away from it um, because of that, because I feel as though, I feel helpless. Um, and I realize that, you know, offering compassion and well, I mean, to me, compassion differs from meta in that it implies action. And the action that I can take is so limited or mm -hmm. feels so limited that it feels that it feels stressful to me. And yeah. so, and, and I also, I'm, I'm in the news business and I've had exposure to gun violence. Um, fortunately not, um, you know, as a victim, but um, it just, it just, it's just hard. Yeah. Because of that, because of the, what feels like a lack of ability to change, to, to, yeah. to effect um, change. And so I don't know how to handle that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it's interesting. There has been quite a lot of research around like novelty. Um, and, and our ability to empathize, and then also just kind of group size, right? There's a certain amount of people we can care about. And when it tips over, we just can't, it gets too diffuse for us. And I think, you know, one aspect of what you're describing is when we think about, you know, gun violence, the numbers, the sheer numbers, it's overwhelming. And that's why I do think there's this very particular and specific methodology where we Think of one person in that. You know, I um, for a while I was practicing Tonglen for Syria, and that's a lot. It's a lot of people, a lot of suffering, a lot of pain, a lot of different forms. And I would get overwhelmed. And I started just focusing on what it was like for one mother, hmm. what it was like for one nurse. And I think that that's, you know, that's that is again speaks to our evolutionary um, 
tribalism, you know, our, our environment of evolutionary adaptiveness for most of human history was such a small group of people that everyone we saw was kind of connected to us in some way or another. And now we're faced with like so many people who will never meet and yet their suffering is real. Can you, that's helpful and um, specifically gun violence in the United States um, and the lack of, the seeming lack of ability to affect change by the people yeah. and change it. That is my specific. Yeah, question. and that goes back to, to go our very history. favorite slogan. The best one, you know, we're not supposed to have favorites. Give up all hope of fruition, right? And that doesn't mean give up hope. It's just that we give up an idea that we know how it's gonna end. We are like outrageously compassionately intended. We practice and practice, and yet we don't pretend to know that we, we know how it's gonna unfold. And that's the hardest practice, because that's, you know what that is, which totally is unbelievably, challenging and annoying it's that patience is like this unbelievable spiritual quality and i think you know what occludes and gets in the way of our empathy and compassion is also blame aversion denial and a lot of the flavor of those is anger we're fucking pissed we're fucking tired of this shit already excuse my language and that's energizing and it also kind of like distracts us away from the suffering, away from our caring. And so this, you know, um, the teacher I'm fortunate to sit with often has this thing that comforts me, which she says, you know, we have no reason to question that this life in this way is the perfect curriculum for waking up. We want it to be different. Hell yeah, we work for change but as part of the way it's oriented. So it, it's not to say that it's okay and let's not help. It's more, we don't know. We don't know what this does to our heart, this thrashing. Maybe there's a benefit of it we don't recognize. So we keep at it. So it's a bit of a different flavor of give up all hope of fruition. It's all give up knowing, give up knowing that we understand the impact of care, that mm. that in and of itself is like a huge important piece. But I'm with you, Ted. I appreciate you naming it. It's it is. It's it's really it's really tough. So our inefficacy, our ability that we don't feel we can do anything, our denial, our avoidance, our blame, and then our succumbing into the suffering. Those are the biggest hazards, right? That we can create. Right. That last thing you said was very helpful. I'm right. so glad. Yeah. Lucy, I see you made it back with us. Did you hear? Did you hear any of that comment? No, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know my phone was going to die. And oh. now I have uh, my phone on the charger, which can't have but headphones. So, okay. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I can... I, yeah. I, I, I essentially, and I'm happy to um, answer any more, but I essentially said, like, I, it is a really pinched time for us when we are facing loss and we are supporting others. And um, I also lost my mom this year. So I'm really moved to hear about, you know, your loss. And I can not imagine what it's like for you, but I know what it was like for me. And um, it's such an amazing proving ground of our, our empathy. We're so close to suffering when we're in loss. Um, and I've just appreciated you really tending to your own needs and compassion. I think that's really- It's, it's hard. It, it's really, really hard. I mean, I had to literally hold my own hand and say, you know, yes, you can do this and yeah, you can do this. So yeah. yeah. Thank and you. If, Thank if you. you. If you hold your heart, you actually release oxytocin, right? The bonding yeah. chemical. So mm -hmm. it is powerful. It's like a, it's a true resourcing. So yeah. Glad you're with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. My phone died on you. No problem. That's, this is that world we live in. Okay, there's two other raised hands here. But I can't see who they are because my screen's weirdly small. Oh, Marianne! Hi! Hi, Eve. Um, so, yeah, this week has been strange with the news. And um, last year, with all the protesting and 
BLM, I, you know, I really wanted to be an ally and advocate and I was really strong and um, talking about it and voicing my opinion. But with the shooting, I just felt this distance that I've had and space and not like space, like vast awareness, um, kind of space when you're meditating with sound and you notice the distance from the sound to yourself and that mm -hmm. space between them. I've noticed a lot of space um, uh, with the shootings. And, you know, when I do think about it, it's kind of like this, you know, I get really angry and it's, I don't want to be in anime fantasy and all this other stuff that's happened in my life. And, um, but I think when we were doing Tonglin and you mentioned families that really, really grounded things and really helped connect back to, um, what my intentions are. So hmm. that was really helpful. I'm so glad. Yeah. Thanks for describing that. And I think, yeah, you know, that that space could be, I don't know your experience, that space could be like, there is a self-protective mechanism where we're just like, nope, nope, not going to feel that. Can't really go there right now. And that's totally okay. And actually it's you very expertly used meditation to go to the place you needed to go. Right. Because sometimes it's, it's not safe or appropriate or helpful for us to go all the way in without that container, right? Of like, what's so cool about our compassion practices is we really create a transformative container. And then we can travel back in time or we can go out to other places in the world and bring it here instead of us kind of like, you know, losing ourselves into that suffering. And so the more we feel this is a steady vessel, which, you know, for you, it is like, you could bring that here. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's another hand, but I'm sorry you can't see it. And if not, we can move on to this very strange slogan. Oh, it's no. Um, well, one thing I was going to say is what I think you just said, Eve, which is, you know, this is why we practice. So we have the capacity to hold all this suffering, whether it's our own or others. Um, and then, but then what I really want to say, going back to what you said at the very beginning about compassion distress, I, I had never heard that term. And I, and I have always felt like, so not quite comfortable with the concept of compassion fatigue like we have fatigue of being compassionate like i never really bought it but it sounds to me like it's actually compassion distress fatigue empathic like, distress so you did say empathic distress correct so then there's been a little argue, a side argument oh. going on oh. in the chat about that yes. so i wanted oh. you to clarify yes yeah because i understood it as if you if so you know when i walk out my door i live in the mission there is often like someone right there outside my front door you know in some kind of distress or in many kinds of distress yeah and i don't usually feel like there's anything i can really do right then and there like in the sense that i would if i lived in a village and that was my neighbor right. which is my neighbor but i have too many neighbors and i can't like attend to this person who is hurting yeah. right here and and so I was understanding it as like the, 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 the feeling empathy, but not being able to do anything about it is what we get fatigued over. Yes, exactly. Okay. And so if we, if we look at, um, you know, there's a beautiful set of research studies um, out of the Max Planck Institute in Germany, a researcher named Tanya Singer, and she worked with Mathieu Ricard. Some of you might know he's like the happiest man in the world. Um, he's a monk and philosopher and teacher of um, Buddhism, and they kind of co-designed a series of research studies to look at, is there really compassion fatigue? Because that term is a bit corrosive in healthcare, educational, uh, criminal justice settings. This idea like that, especially historically in medical education, 
no, 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 don't care about your patients because then you won't be able to do your job. As though there was this binary, either you care and then you really suck at your job because you're overwhelmed and burnt out or you don't care and then you're good like a robot. <laughs> Like maybe needless to say, um, that doesn't work too well, right? We, what we know even just from the medical literature is that when someone is receiving care, whether it is pills or um, other kinds of surgeries and treatments, the empathic presence of the doctor matters for their healing. It matters for actually them being open about their clinical issues so that they can receive appropriate care. It matters even for their reported pain symptoms. So this isn't just wishy-washy like, oh, it's nice to be nice to your patients and students and um, you know, our brothers and sisters who are incarcerated. Like, no, it actually matters. It, it is important, it has causal efficacy. And what can get distressed is this, is this overwhelm. And so they looked at the different neural correlates of of empathic distress and compassion. And essentially with compassion, there's not a, uh, an acute overwhelm. And especially if we think of compassion, like a stance, like an ongoing experience, of course it like rises up in the face of a moment when we witness suffering, but we're always developing compassion. Always, always. It's kind of like at the ready. It's our baseline. The empathic distress often occurs when we either feel like you know we there's nothing we can do and that's kind of a shutdown or we get what's called self-related concern i can't, i can't do anything i i wish i could god this is too much for me so it's so interesting it's not again it's not a buddhist idea but this empathic distress is when you're too self-involved with the suffering of another it's not even about their distress anymore it's about your distress and I think that's really helpful, right? That's where we need that glimpse of emptiness. Like not, not only is it um, not mine, it's not fixed, it's changing, it's moving. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you for that. that. Also kind of related to giving up hope of fruition in a way, because that's right. Giving up hope of fruition is getting sort of fixated as a, as yes. a I, I need to fix this and yes. it's part of who I am. And if I fail at fixing it, then I failed instead of just coming at it yeah. with, a, yeah. with the open compassion. Yeah. And our empathy makes our compassion better. So we don't want to just kind of like blast our compassion. Like I love everyone. I love, I want you to be free. I want you to be free, but not really attending to what is needed. Not really knowing the true causes and conditions. So there's, I know I love this stuff. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna try to do this one because I saw this slogan and I was like, oh, not this slogan. So I knew that meant that I should probably try to figure it out. Um, it's a bit obtuse. Don't transfer the ox's load to the cow, everybody. You know what I'm talking about, right? I actually remember in the good old days, um, back in the Dharma Collective, that the night that Chandra was, um, teaching on this one. And I was like, oh my God, where is she going with this? It doesn't make any sense. And looking at it tonight, um, yes, Walt got it immediately, not a surprise. Carry your weight. Don't put it onto someone else. And what really, I started thinking about that, especially in the context of, um, you know, what's ours to do. And when we're really clear on what's ours to do, right, whether that's you know, the way we want to offer ourselves to the world, the way we want to transform social justice. It's a long road. And some of the work is not always like easy or ideal. And there's parts of it we'd like to kind of just offload to someone else and have them have them do it. And that whole idea of them, right? There's the work I'm going to do, but then they can do that. There's already a distancing within that. And it made me think of this beautiful work. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this uh, philosophical work now, actually decades ago, I think it was in the early 1920s that Martin Buber wrote this very famous book called I and Thou. It's really thin, tiny little book. You could probably order it on the internet for under $2. There's copies floating around everywhere. And the premise of this book has to do with how we consider our relationship to any other and that we can have a relationship that is I and it. That's like us being the ox to the cow. That's like, I've got this thing to do, but 
it or that, someone else can do it. Someone else who's not me, someone else who's different from me, someone who can carry that load. I, I don't really wanna do it. Someone else can carry that load. It's, it's this real transactional approach. And instead, this idea of I and thou, my God, it is so beautiful. And it's interesting because it's, you know, it's not, again, it's not a specifically Buddhist teaching per se, but it has to do with um, a living relationship between two beings. That this idea that we could have an I and thou relationship to anyone that we encounter, whether we read about them on the news, whether we pass them in a car, and that this part of I and thou is that we're not bound up by just kind of what we see in the moment, what we experience in the moment. It's like a whole other realm. And when I was reading a bit up on I and thou, because it kind of came to me and I've, um, some of my great teachers have often referenced Martin Buber. And um, it's interesting that it really has been absorbed not only I think in the, in the Buddhist, contemporary Buddhist canon, but also in the social and racial justice movements. So some of you may be familiar that in the letter from Birmingham jail by Martin Luther King, he references this, how the one of the most important parts of kind of cultural transformation is everybody together moving from this relationship of I, it to I, thou. And it made me think, you know, that there is, there is something about Tonglen that also helps erode this I, it, or to me, it makes more sense, I, that, <laughs> you know, that's happening over there, that's happening in Syria, that's happening to those group of people. It's, it's, not, it's not like me. And that then when we elevate, you know, our relationship to literally all other beings, to I and thou. So we elevate all relationship to this spiritual quality. And for Martin Buber, that was seeing God in everyone, seeing the divine in everyone. Why wouldn't we want to live like that, right? It's hard then, because then we necessarily can't subjugate. We can't put down, we can't deny the suffering of someone who we elevate to the status of being godlike. So it's this kind of beautiful circular <laughs> difficulty, you know, practicing Tonglen really helps us appreciate and recognize the suffering of the world. And it in some ways slowly strips away any possibility of not seeing, honoring, and being with the suffering of the world. I should tell you, I should have told you that sooner. There's no going back. There's no starting Tonglen and going back. You just can't. If you bring the suffering of others into your heart, there's no denying it's your suffering, that it's, there's no separateness. And it's, it is um, incredibly tender. Um, I'd say incredibly challenging and difficult, but just in this most beautiful of ways. Some of the commentary on the don't transfer the ox's load to the cow it's also about our own personal responsibility. And that one of the things we can do in our day-to-day -day life with our commitment to compassion is try to lighten everybody's load. So this one, you know, I don't know if any of the other overdoers in the crowd are like, oh, wait, I'm not gonna, do I never delegate anything ever again? Um, you know, I think, I don't think we wanna go to that extreme. Um, and I think that there's an important balance, of course, of asking for help and receiving help, getting others to care for us. And, um, you know, like I, I, for example, wouldn't know how to rebuild a room in my house. And it would be unwise and unskillful of me to try to do it myself just so I didn't take that load onto anyone. So there's a discerning quality with this slogan where we also, we have to know what is ours. What is ours to do? What is not ours to do? And then how do we fully go into it? And the way we fully go into it is, yeah, having this technology, this Tonglen, this ability to meet um, the suffering of others, make it into actually fuel for our fire, 
as opposed to a feeling of depletion or, or overwhelm. And to really, you know, start developing this sacred relationship to other beings, like that they are divine. It's really tough. Um, and really, um, yeah, worth the effort. So, okay, got my little piece out. Um, wanna see if there's anything in here in the chat I missed. Okay. Great. Diane says, I don't think it's about not delegating. There's an element of the slogan about foisting something I'm responsible on to an underling who won't be able to do it. Someone who thinks they're superior, foisting something onto someone else and getting away with it. Yeah, there is an interesting, there is an interesting kind of, I won't say dismissive, but um, kind of power balance quality in this one of the one, the slogan we did just before this and the slogan that comes after, they're all about kind of social judgment and social evaluation. You know, are we talking poorly about others? Are we throwing them under the bus? And it's really getting to sometimes some of us, all of us in certain ways, we reach certain levels of power. That is a part of this world. What do we do with that power? How do we act with that power? What's again, interesting to me in the research full circle is we know that empathy is actually a really important quality for rising to power. So people who are empathic rise to higher levels of power. And then unfortunately, and maybe ironically, they often lose that empathy when they reach levels of power. This has been repeated in many studies and often the studies are a little silly, I'll be honest. They're in like a whole laboratory setup. It doesn't feel like real life. But this idea of when a person is given power, they become actually a bit more selfish. So part of my wondering with this slogan is also, is it pointing out that if we are this ox who is, you know, has some sort of strength and responsibility and we actually can foist upon another. I like that word, Diane, foist. We can put upon another what is actually ours to do. How do we take that responsibility? How do we hold it? Um, and again, I think it, it has to come directly back to really being aware of when we're putting someone above us, when we're putting someone below us, or when we're doing this like beautiful I and thou. And not just, you're just like me. It's like, you are just like me, sacred and divine. It elevates both at the same time. Yeah. I want to, um, yeah. Thank you, JF. Also recognizing our aversion to weight. Yes. We don't want to carry that burden of the ox. And, you know, I, I don't know. You know, hard work is... Um, is definitely not like uh, um, prized in our culture, but many of us work really goddamn hard. Um, so I think there's a lot, there's a lot of bearing, um, but it is interesting to notice those, those things we feel like it shouldn't be ours to do. Someone else should be doing that. It is good to look at. I wanted to go back what, to what Leanne was asking about with, um, yeah, when we encounter you know, our brothers and sisters in the street who are unsheltered and how we work with that. I had a, the good fortune to do a training online a couple of weeks back for the San Francisco homeless outreach team. Maybe you've seen these guys in the streets. They go out there day in and day out and provide uh, life-saving medical care funded by the Department of Health in San Francisco. And I did a little compassion training for these folks. Um, so humbling. Like, I was like, what am I going to tell you about compassion? You do this work every day. And, you know, it was what was inspiring to me about it for, from, from their side was how easy it was for them to find what they were grateful for in their work. It's beautiful. A lot of a feeling of appreciation. They do work that is so meaningful. And I think one thing that they have, which I, I can relate to, um, when I worked at San Francisco General as a frontline social worker in the ER, I got to work with a lot of um, homeless and unsheltered populations. And 
I actually got to really know who these individuals were and their life and their story. And it made the suffering um, easier to bear because it wasn't like this person in this terrible situation, it's always been like that. It'll always be like that for them. I was like, wow, this person was a minister. Oh my God, that person was a singer. This person, they used to run a farm. Like recognizing that, um, you know, that kind of ever-changing and permanent nature where they were, this station in their life, unhoused, mentally ill, unwell, of course, devastating, but not the entirety of that being. And so I think this opportunity for us when we encounter folks who are in an acute phase of suffering, again, not to be like, oh, they're suffering right now, but it's okay. They probably didn't suffer at some point. But for us to like widen the aperture and really say like, I feel this suffering. It's not the entirety of this being. It's not the beginning of the story and it doesn't necessarily mean it's the end. That's the place we can continue to show up with our care and our compassion. Again, we don't use this to then say, and it's not my problem. It's still our problem. All suffering is our problem. And when I say problem, I just mean our opportunity for practice, right? It's ours. We, we can really help ourselves out by not getting lost in an idea that it's fixed, that it's solid, that it's always the same. This is a really good one to try with your friends and family members too, <laughs> who are suffering sometimes at their own making, right? I mean, we haven't talked about that tonight. There's no greater challenge to our empathy and compassion than those we love who make their own lives miserable. That can be so easy to just throw in the towel, to turn away, to get pissed. And, you know, keeps changing. Maybe not fast enough, maybe not in the direction we like, but it keeps changing. That is encouraging. Yeah. So I'm going to maybe give us a couple minutes here to drop back in such beautiful conversation and connection. Let's come right back in to this Tonglen practice together, actually. So beginning by really reestablishing the seat of your attention into the field of sensations in the body. As though turning your eyes inward to gaze at your own heart. Notice and feel what's here. Maybe something has shifted or changed since we first sat down together and attended to the body. I'm taking one palm to the heart space over the chest, establishing this sense of connection and presence. Touching in once again to this intrinsic, innate capacity and quality to love and be loved. And feel or imagine that this heart has that ocean quality vast, deep, capable of holding everything that falls within it without preference, without judgment.
And consider opening this vast oceanic quality of the heart and the heart's compassion. And dedicating ourselves this time together tonight to alleviate the suffering of each and every being. Inviting them all into this ocean of compassion. Considering the beautiful possibility that all beings could know peace and ease. All beings could feel belonging and safe. And all beings would know the true causes of suffering and be free. And placing our hands together in prayer, if that feels comfortable, and bowing to one another. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for your motivation. Mm -hmm. So nice to be with you all.